This past Tuesday, I took a group of Episcopal deans to the University of Texas Harry Ransom Center to view some of the treasures of the collection. The curator, Aaron Pratt, had chosen items he thought would be of particular interest to Christian scholars of Bible, liturgy, and church history. The first piece he presented was a recent acquisition, P-134, known as the Willoughby Papyrus. You may have read about it when it was publicized here in 2022. Discovered on eBay in 2015, its provenance was meticulously researched and then purchased for the library. It turned out it had belonged to a Professor Harold Willoughby at the University of Chicago who had collected it in the 1920s. It's a fragment of papyrus about this big with faint Greek writing visible on the right side and on the back, against the grain, some more writing. It's covered in glass so that you can turn it over and read both sides. It has been dated from between 250 and 350 of the Common Era, the third or fourth century. It's very old. A remarkable feature of this papyrus is that it's not from a New Testament codex like most early Christian books, but from a scroll. There are lots of mysteries about the whole scroll, how this little piece got separated from the rest, and for what purpose that bit was used. But even with the gaps and tears, you can see it is a fragmentary writing of John 1, 50 to 51. You will see greater things than these. You will see angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And if it isn't this Sunday's reading, Think the gathered scholars and preachers. How extraordinary. From the third century to the 21st, from Greek words inscribed on a piece of reed to its English translation printed clear as day on this service sheet at the Church of the Good Shepherd. Here is a promised vision of angels climbing a moving staircase and returning upon the Son of Man. What good news shines forth for us from it this morning? These words are the climactic ending to this very odd story at the beginning of the Gospel of John. An episode that begins with the mundane and ends in the sublime. It goes from people the readers don't even know yet, Philip and Nathaniel, to the superheroes Moses and the prophets, and even to the person of Israel himself. It moves from the rough country of Galilee with its place names, Visita, and particular spots under the fig tree, all the way to heaven itself. Jesus' dialogue with Nathanael displays the ironies of seeking, seeing, knowing God, and it introduces us to the incredible journey that is the fourth gospel. We're familiar with terminology today of seekers. It's applied to those who are searching for meaning and belonging and a connection with the spiritual, but who don't identify with religion or domination, denomination or church. John's gospel understands that everyone is a seeker. Searching and seeking is our essential activity as human beings. When two disciples of John the Baptizer spontaneously begin to follow Jesus, he asks them, what are you looking for? What are you seeking? We come here seeking. Perhaps we don't know exactly what. What do we want to find? Is it something from the past that we have lost? 
Is it something in the future we don't yet recognize? It may be a bit of both. Something we knew for sure at one time, childlike innocence and imagination, or something ahead, some sense of reassurance that all will be well. Here, in this story in John, there's a maze, a network, a chain of seeking and finding, of siblings, of friends with specific names. Jesus finds Philip. Philip finds Nathaniel. Seeking is not only solo, but social. What friends have joined you in your seeking? What family members, teachers, companions have come alongside you as you have searched? It turns out that Philip and Andrew and Peter have been seeking in the scripture, in the law of Moses and in the prophets. They've been reading, and for some reason, we don't know why, they believe that they have found the one that they have sought in this man they've run into in Galilee. So they name him and his hometown and his pedigree. We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. But Nathaniel doesn't buy it. You've got to be kidding. A nobody from nowhere. One reason I love the Gospel of John is all the incredulous characters, all the skeptical ones, all the ones unafraid to call baloney, to ask for more information, to demand further experiences. Think about them, Nicodemus, the woman at the well, Thomas. Sometimes we 21st century people are too polite or too shy or too afraid to be disappointed to ask the questions we really want to ask. We feel pressure to pretend we are satisfied and have enough faith already. The Gospel of John has lots of great lines about this incredulity, but here is the way Nathaniel puts it. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And his friend Philip answers, come and see. Take another step. Take another step with me. Check him out. But before we know whether Nathaniel accepts the invitation or not, Jesus is already in action, seeing Nathaniel approaching, concluding from the remark, which is actually an insult, that Nathaniel is honest, pure, trustworthy, an Israelite without deceit. I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Jesus knew Nathaniel already when he was under the fig tree, whatever that means. Maybe it means he was reading under there, or resting, or praying, assuming he was unseen, but he's not. Minding his own business, not even looking, oblivious, restless, preoccupied the way most of us are most of the time, under the fig tree. This is the way faith works. We seek, but Jesus has already found us. We want to see, and Christ has already seen us. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. In prayer, we experience this being seen and known. The essential truth that God is seeing us and hearing us. Nathaniel is knocked out. He's convinced. He's converted. He makes his confession of faith. Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. He's transported from ignorance to knowledge, from pseudo-sophistication to wholehearted faith. Mission accomplished, 
He's seen it, we've seen it happen, end of story. But no, there will be even more, says Jesus. And then we get to these extraordinary words inscribed on the papyrus. You will see greater things than these. You will see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Scripture seekers will remember Jacob, the father of Israel, and the night in Bethel, when with a stone as his pillow, he had a dream. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set upon the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So the story in the Gospel of John ends up in a non-literal place, a non-ordinary place, a place in Holy Scripture, a place where heaven and earth are connected by a dreamlike ladder, a place where Jesus is the gateway to heaven. The truth of this episode is the truth of the whole gospel. In it, the ordinary and the extraordinary are one and the same. The son of Joseph is son of God and king of Israel. In the poor countryside of Galilee, there is access to heaven. He is the man from Nazareth and the one who was in the beginning with God. And in the fourth gospel, we will see signs, his signs of the glory of God. We will glimpse and overhear more odd stories of strange encounters and oblique conversations. And finally, we will see Jesus, himself the ladder between earth and heaven, in his death and exaltation on the cross, drawing all people to himself. Scholars hypothesize why this verse, John 1, 51, came to be written in the Willoughby Papyrus. These words from the opening of John, they hypothesize, possessed special power, a magical force. One theory is that this scrap was contained in an amulet, a charm worn close to the body for healing or for protection from evil. These treasured words are very old. They're very good news passed down to us contemporary seekers. We are brought to faith through other people with a little help from our friends. We come to faith through experience as literal and simple as coming to church as extraordinary and mystical as a vision of traveling angels. The harder we look, the more surprised we are to find God knowing us, seeing us, finding us. Faith is mystical, intellectual, social, physical. It spans Galilee, and Chicago, and Austin, and the whole world. Take another step with me. Take another step with your friends. Come and see. Amen.